Sandra. I want to acknowledge my co-vice president, Jody Dietz, who's over here, who um, chaired last month's program. Um, we hear the term fake news so frequently now that I don't know that we have a shared understanding of what it means. So today we've got two speakers who spent a lot of time in the journalistic field. Mr. Sam Neff, immediately to my left, and Derek Donovan. Sam is the co-host of the political podcast State House Blend on KCUR. And before joining the station in August of 2014, he covered health and education for KCPT. He is an Overland Park, Kansas native. He's the winner of a National News and Documentary and Documentary Emmy for investigative reporting. He's also won four Edward R. Murrow Awards, four National Headliner Awards. Um, he has an extensive background, including television in St. Louis and being the executive producer of special projects at CBS stations in Minneapolis and Kansas City. Derek Donovan has been with the Kansas City Star Paper since 1995, and among other roles, he was director of research and information until 2017, when he went to work with the editorial page staff as community engagement editor, helping to bring us columns, letters, and more on the editorial page. To quote him, we move beyond the simplistic left-right model of the cable TV screening heads and our deeply fractured alternative online echo chambers. His emphasis at the star is always on fairness and accuracy, but all sorts of other topics will come to the forefront of the editorial page. He commented previously on the impact of the internet and social media on the news, and he's here to do so again. I give you Sam Neff and Derek Dunn. Can you hear me okay? All right. So, uh, first of all, it's, it's really great to see this many people on an early Saturday morning because uh, anybody who tells you that Americans are not fired up about what's going on um, in the news right now, they are wrong about that. Um, I was actually just telling Sam before we started, I do a lot of things uh, for the opinion pages at the Star, but one of my, uh, the things that take most of my time is I edit the letters to the editor. That means I read everything that comes in, I choose them, I put, the, put them together. You can probably not imagine how much work that is. Um, right now in my inbox, I checked it before I started here, it's at 485 submissions right now. So if somebody tells you people don't care about the news, people don't care about current events, people don't care about uh, delivering opinions to other Americans, they are dead wrong. I have been doing this for a really, really long time. Before I came to the, uh, the editorial board, I was the reader's representative, public editor. You might know me from, from that, those roles. I have worked with letters to the editor for, I think, going on about 14 years right now. This is the heaviest number of submissions, the, the heaviest load of, of letters to the editor I have ever seen. Now, I was actually just telling Sam before we started, a lot of that has to do with Las Vegas. There's something about the Las Vegas massacre that has lit a fire under people that I completely understand. There's, I mean, anybody who says, I don't, under, I don't get these passions, I really, really understand it because it's come at a real zeitgeist in the culture at the moment. And one of the things that I personally kind of feel in my bones, I, I we could be wrong, but fake news is almost to a little bit of a turning point where I think people are starting to sort of wake up and understand, hey, there's really something to journalism out there. And, you know, it, it's funny for me because I, before I actually came to the STAR, I was uh, an academic. I actually thought I was going to do my PhD in applied research. And my master's thesis was on the UFO subculture. And so I lived for two years in the world of UFO subculture. Now, mind you, this was in the mid '90s. Uh, this was the internet was around, but this was definitely before, before. It was before the World Wide Web. It was certainly before most people had access to things such as Facebook. Um, there was Usenet. Anybody here 
know about Usenet, knew, yeah, Usenet was, it was Facebook before Facebook was. But I lived for two years among those folks. There are a few people who are intentional bad actors who really try to basically make a living off of lying to other people. Um, in the UFO subculture, the patient zero for this is a guy named Bob Lazar, who he, he's made a career out of lying about having worked for the federal government and seeing UFOs. And that's, that's the bottom line. The guy is a criminal. He should be in jail because he's made a career out of lying to people about this. But by and large, most people, they don't go into, uh, they don't try to seek out fake news in order to lie to themselves and in order to create a false narrative for the rest of the world. There's something in the human psyche, very deeply ingrained, that wants to know secrets that other people don't know. There's something about all of us where we want to feel like we are more informed than the hoi we, you know, We want to think, hey, we have the real answers to it. That is what is behind fake news. And everybody who left, right, center, um, top, bottom, doesn't make any difference. Everybody has that instinct. And that is what is so troubling about the people who have decided, hey, we are going to latch on to this, we're going to make a lot of money off it, we are going to create these false narratives out there that is going to latch into that reptilian part of our brains that wants to be smarter than everybody else. There are some people who are doing it purely opportunistically. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the reports of you know, the Estonian teenagers literally sitting in their bedroom making up this fake news that appeals to Americans and made lots of money during the election by selling ads on Facebook. And again, this is, this is Facebook's problem, folks. Facebook is selling news, and they are branding it as news where it's really just information. It's really just things that people have typed out, whether it has a basis in fact or not. Reporting is a real thing, and for somebody like me, you know, who's been at Star for 22 years, it's, it's not even a question of whether uh, the, the whole idea of somebody making something up sitting in a bedroom in Estonia is ridiculous to folks like me and Sam who have been around newsrooms for our entire careers because that's not how news is created. News is created by folks going out in the field, talking to policymakers, talking to innocent victims of shootings, talking to people whose, whose kids have been kicked out of school for um, you know, creating a reference, whatever it is that the news is. We create news by talking to people who have been involved in events. It is completely different from a teenager sitting in a room or a KGB, a former KGB agent intentionally latching onto an American angst of some kind and creating a piece of information that purports to be news and putting it on Facebook. And then Facebook taking money for that as they deliver it to you in your field, in your feed, because they've determined what interests you have, what topics you click on, and they know, hey, this is something that comports to your interests, and so I'm going to feed it to you. So we're at a really different point than we were just 15 years ago when people got news by picking up the newspaper from their front porch, by turning on the radio station, and listening to people whose job it was to go to city council meetings, report on what was said there, and deliver the information to you. So how are we going to shake this all down? You know, I personally think we are right now in a really major crucible of companies like Facebook, and it's mostly Facebook and Google folks that are responsible for all this, understanding what their responsibilities are, how incredibly culpable they are for where we are right now, and deciding that we're going to do the socially, uh, the socially responsible thing and figure out a way to filter out this nonsense and get it to the people, get it to the citizens of the world in an honest way. You know, this is Facebook and Google's problem where we are right now, in my opinion, and they're the ones who are going to have to fix it. So now I'm off my soapbox and over to say. <laughs> Indulge the way I look. Uh, right after we get done here, I'm off to Lawrence to go to. Uh, oh, here we go. Better uh, to go to uh, the KU game. And while I can't define exactly fake news, I certainly know fake football. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so I come to uh, I come to this through uh, two filters. So in addition to what I do at Case I do a little history podcast called Archiver. Uh, and so I'm always looking back to see what what are the lessons that we're going to learn uh, from what's come uh, before us. Uh, and the notion of uh, straight down the middle news is not really the history of journalism in America. Uh, up, it's really a, in the last. 60 or 70 years, if that's been, uh, if that's been the case. Reading a biography right now of uh, William Allen White. Uh, and there was a time, for most of journalistic history, that you knew what side of the issue your local paper stood on. This is when there were multiple papers and multiple voices, and multiple opinions. So this notion that we have always been straight down the middle, uh, objective journalism, isn't necessarily the case. What we, where we've come, though, is uh, from perhaps a non-objective look at the news, there's a slant and there's an opinion to really sitting in a basement uh, in some foreign country just cranking out uh, fiction. Uh, and Derek is right. It's Facebook and Google, and they have to, uh, and they, and they have to fix this. My other background, uh, so for 17 years while I worked in Philadelphia, I covered organized crime. Uh, and so what I know is that the bad guys are always ahead of the good guys. And as soon as Facebook and Google fix this, and I happen to think that they will, that, uh, that w will it be because they want to do the right thing? Yeah, I tend to think they're, uh, they're more worried about uh, the long-term viability of the business and will, they, uh, and will so many people abandon them. So, so I happen to believe that they will fix it. But no, absolutely no that the bad guys are always ahead of the good guys, uh, the next question is, if they can't do it on Facebook, if you can't buy uh, anonymous ads on Facebook, or you can't push this out through other social media channels, how will the fake news get out? Uh, because I think it's now become part of the political landscape. Uh, it, we know, even though it's a pretty recent thing, we know that it works. And so I think that we need to be uh, aware of what's the next thing? What's the next way uh, that they're going to uh, that they're going to be able to scam us with fake news? Uh, just when you think that you've uh, you know you you figured out a way to shut down sports book, uh, the bad guys figure out a, a better way of uh, a better way of doing it. Uh, I'll also just say that you know so uh, not uh, not long ago I was uh, manning our booth the KCUR booth at the uh, Plaza Art Fair. And uh, any number of people came up and said, where is your I stand with the facts stuff? Right, your cups or tote bags or, you know, all those tchotchkes that we, uh, that we give out. Uh, and that marketing phrase is relatively new. Uh, NPR came up with it a few months ago. Uh, and we've all hit it hard. But it has, in a way that most, uh, because in public broadcasting we're not particularly good marketers, uh, but this one uh, has, uh, has hit home. Uh, and when people want pens or whatever it is that you can put, I stand with the facts on, uh, that gives me hope uh, that, uh, that there is a big part of the population uh, who understands uh, what fake news is. And, that's a, and, I think it, and I think one of the questions, and I don't know that we'll be able to answer it completely, is, is fake news just the stuff that uh, uh, that we see on Breitbart that gets generated in uh, in other parts of uh, other parts of the world that push through our social media? Is it a story that you just don't like uh, that you disagree with? Uh, I think that's part of the uh, that's part of the, the definition of, uh, of fake news, uh, and that's the part that in some ways scares me the most that we can't have a an agreed on set of facts or at least most of the facts that we can agree on, and then uh, argue about others. Uh, I think anytime you start to label a story that you just don't like, that may be damaging to you uh, as fake news, I think that goes a lot farther uh, to, to damage the, uh, the, journalistic, uh, the journalistic piece of this world that we need uh, to hold powerful people, or even semi-powerful. One of the things that Mr. Zepka said that I want to seize on the most is that 
uh, you sort of imply that public radio listeners are engaged um, in a lot of ways with their communities and they care about facts. And that's true about newspaper readers as well. And one of the things that I don't think people probably appreciate as much as they ought to is what an immense public good that the advertising model of particularly newspapers, but also radio and TV, was until about the mid to late 90s. Um, that advertising model really had revenue coming in to newspapers and TV stations and radio stations. And we, you don't have to worry about it as much public radio. Um, but you do. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, newspapers were just printing money by the mid 90s. Um, the, the, the revenues, of, you know, the, the margins in the newspaper industry were in the 30% range um, in the mid 90s. For those of you, for example, who work in groceries or some of these other industries, you know, it was literally 15 times the amount of the average margin of the newspaper uh, of, of businesses. That enabled newspapers to expand, and newspapers have always been prompt, but it allowed them to expand to a way that had never been seen in the entire in the entire history of, of of modern America, that doesn't exist anymore. And I'm I, I know that this sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but to call us boy and girl scouts in the newspaper industry and in public radio in, in journalism is an understatement. People do not go into the reporting field because they want to make a ton of money. You know, people who like the girl we're all very well from what we're doing. That is not right. People go into it the same reason they go into things like social work and uh, into a lot of fields that are wanting to deliver the truth and to help the general populace. I mean, that's just kind of why people go into journalism. The business model allowed newspapers to get so big and to you know really investigate a whole lot of stuff. The real tragedy of the internet is that the business model has not held forth the same way, and so that is the reason that media companies that started out as newspapers have shrunk so much over the past 10 years is you simply can't sell the number of car ads and especially classified ads that used to keep everything afloat the way the traditional print of the newspaper industry had. And so that is our big reckoning in, in this business. And I don't think it is coincidental that fake news has risen at the same time the number of gatekeepers that have been there to try to tamp it down has dropped. You just point out, uh, I had a long career in television uh, before right here, so 30 years in commercial broadcasting. And, uh, and if you think the uh, margin at the star, which is pretty common actually, a 30% profit margin, uh, I worked for about a year at the all news radio station in Philadelphia, KOW, uh, where our profit margin was 60%. And, uh, and the only other people that uh, had that kind of profit margin uh, were the Genovese. <laughs> and, uh, and when I first got to, when I first moved to Philadelphia in 1985, that was the uh, and I worked for Night Center for a while. Uh, that's when uh, the uh, the Philadelphia Choir was at its uh, at its height, uh, and they probably had spread out over the three states that we covered in Philadelphia. Uh, honestly, 500 reporters, just reporters. That's boots on the ground. That doesn't count editors, photographers, uh, other uh, other folks that you need to make the, uh, the newsroom work. As that, and Derek is absolutely right, as that uh, business model dwindled, uh, there's been layoffs and layoffs and layoffs of people shrunk. Uh, and that news hole that we used to fill with really good journalism, it's harder to fill now. And, uh, and somebody's going to fill that back. Somebody is going to come in and say, you know, you guys want, you guys want information. Uh, it used to be, for the most part, really good information. Uh, now we all have to be suspicious of almost everything that we see pop into our Facebook feed or pop into uh, our Google search. Uh, it's now much more uh, difficult for all of you, and it is incumbent upon all of you uh, to figure out what is not fake, Again, the definition, I think, is a little squishy. Uh, it may be like pornography. We know it when we see it. Uh, but this, is a, this makes your lives a lot more difficult. When I was a kid, two times a day, the newspaper landed in our driveway, and we would read it, and we felt pretty confident that it was, uh, everything was okay. Uh, now, I don't know uh, uh, 
outside of traditional legacy media, which you're both a part of. Uh, you know, when Fox first came, I don't know if you watch, uh, you read them on the internet, uh, but every time there's a new Axios, uh, Axios has come up, uh, I have to ask myself, you know, is this real? Like, where did these people come from? Who invests in this, right? Who's on the board of directors? I mean, there's homework uh, that has to be done now before you consume the news. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I hate it. Uh, but if you're going to be informed, you're going to have to know uh, who your trusted sources are. And one of the, I, I think, big tragedies, I'm going to get a little bit partisan here because I'm on the editorial board and I can do it. <laughs> well, one of the things that we have really realized under the Trump administration is that a lot of our democracy has been on the honor system in the past. And, you know, the Trump administration has granted press credentials to a site called Gateway Pundit. And I don't know if you guys know about Gateway Pundit, but it is the most subliterate piece of garbage <laughs> website imaginable. And this is the thing that is bad for conservatism. And I think one of the things that we, um, as opinion journalists, because I'm an opinion journalist now, need to educate conservatives about is that fake conservatism is ruinous to what they're doing. There is a really good case to be made for limiting the scope of the government in people's lives. There is a really good case to be made for making sure that the money that taxpayers pay to the government is spent responsibly, right? People at Gateway Pundit, people at, at the Drudge Report, people at Breitbart are doing an immense disservice to those decent Americans who want to see conservatism carried out in government. What they're doing is they are appealing to the darkest corners of that psyche, and they are trying to run with it for money, period, end of sentence. Gateway Pundit is the worst of the worst. I mean, you think Breitbart is bad, the Gateway Pundit is like Breitbart with lobotomy, and it has press access in the White House. That is a tragedy for American democracy. How are headlines different now than these? Sam, what do you think? I'm not sure that's true. Uh, all the other, on the other hand, uh, again, uh, 30 years in commercial television, uh, in a very competitive, in very competitive market, uh, I had to learn uh, how to write. So before there was Twitter, I was writing 140 character uh, teases uh, in television for years, uh, and the. Uh, um, and the pressure uh, for me to get uh, that a 10 o'clock audience uh, into the second quarter hour was uh, enormous. Uh, I can't tell you the, the times where uh, we would get overnight ratings in television. You know, the, uh, one of the, the horrible things about television, but one of the great things too, is that you come in every morning and you know exactly how you did. Uh, and when uh, and, and when you lost that uh, big chunk of your audience at 10:15. It wasn't uncommon for the, uh, for the general manager to call you in and say, this has got to stop. Uh, because it meant that, that those 10 o'clock numbers uh, drove the rest of the, uh, the newsroom that goes to profit. So, it is, so if your question is, are headlines sexier? Are teases more easy? Uh, the, answer is, the answer is yes. And I think, you know, I mean, we think about this too. I mean, it's not just the star that has a website, right? So uh, at KCUR, we you know we look at the analytics, and so we know uh, we know what stories on our web attract uh, viewers. Uh, and Derek knows this better than I. They've been tracking this longer, but you know you can uh, you can plug in software and you can see exactly where some where the audience stopped reading in a story. So as they scroll down on the internet, uh, you know you can see that you've lost ten percent of or you've lost 30% of the audience. You know, so how much of that audience gets to the, gets to the bottom of the uh, uh, bottom of the story? So the, how we entice you to, uh, to come to our stories now, uh, and 
more, just as importantly, uh, how do we keep you on that page uh, has become a, a much more, uh, much more of an, uh, of an art. Headline writing is always, I think a newspaper's been an art, uh, but I think it's even more crucial now on the internet about how you're going to get people to click on your story and stay on that story. And I think that's even more pronounced in my world, um, just the change, because the reality is, 20 years ago, the star would have four people at City Hall going to every committee meeting, and you, the reporter who was at the Transportation Committee meeting would sit in a meeting uh, for two hours and say, well, I was in that meeting for two hours, so I need to write a story. And so she would come back to the newsroom, and she would write an eight-inch story, and it would go into the local section you know, on page four, and it would basically recount the minutes of that of that hearing. And who would really read that thing? Well, we didn't really know. There was no way of knowing in the print world. We know much more what people are reading now. And so that was the type of journalism we call broccoli journalism. Nobody's really that fired up about it. But you know, you need to do it anyway. That's the big casualty in the age of metrics, where we know, as Sam was saying, exactly how many people clicked on this story. And what's more than that, we know how many people scroll down, you know, 20% down the page. And, and there's a, this software we use called Charty that tells you all of these things. And the reality is, we know that if we've got something that gets literally 15 people reading it, that's not worth doing anymore. The bad side to that is, damn it, those 15 people who were really engaged are some of the best citizens in this town. And those people are the ones who are suffering the most in the new world where we can't afford to, unfortunately, do a ton of broccoli journalism. Yeah. Question back here, white t-shirt. Yes, um, so I come at this from a healthcare perspective, and I think that journalism as a profession needs to maybe take a little bit of ownership in this fake news. And the, the reason I say that is the medical community a long time ago <coughs> decided that there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out here selling fake medicine, and there are people doing real medicine with evidence-based approach. And how do we help differentiate between the two? We don't ask people to guess, are they going to a snake oil salesman or not, because there's a licensure process. And I wonder if the journalism community needs to have something similar, not to censor disagreeing opinions, so there's a difference between opinion and investigative journalism, but what are your methods and what's your verification process before you print a news article? And what's your credentials in order to be a White House journalist? <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good question. Uh, and I'm going to uh, answer it in two ways. Uh, the, the only credential I need is the First Amendment. Any one of you today want to start a website and call yourself a journalist, this is America and you can do that. Um, when you start to license journalists is when I would much rather uh, deal with fake news than have some authority, whether it's governmental or yeah, even something that, uh, that the industry comes up with, licensed journalists. It's not something that would lead to, uh, I think, the kind of information that you want. Now, having said that, uh, uh, I think that internally, I've never worked at a news organization that didn't take hiring uh, qualified people seriously. We don't, uh, even in television, where you think we're just hiring pretty people, uh, and I'm not going to say that that's not part of it because you want people to watch, uh, but we hire serious people. Uh, we hire people who are credentialed. Uh, now, I don't know, I don't happen to, I don't have a college degree. I didn't uh, finish at uh, KU and had nothing to do with football, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and mostly with, uh, inability to, to function uh, within a journalistic, or within an academic area. Uh, but, but we hire people who have experience and credentials, uh, and I think if we got to the point of licensing people, uh, I think that would be, uh, I think that would be a bad thing. Now, you know, they hand out press credentials to go to the White House, obviously. Uh, but that's, I think that's more, it seems to me, to control a small room. You know, you want to go to, uh, you want to, go to a Sam Brownback news conference? You walk in, you go to a Sam Brownback news conference. 
Uh, if you want to go to a, a hearing, uh, to an education committee hearing at the Capitol, you go to an education committee uh, hearing at the Capitol. Uh, they live at, uh, at the Kansas legislature who you need a pass to get onto the uh, floor of the House and Senate. But that is, again, it's, just a, it's a small area. Uh, and you are, I don't know why they think that you're in closer contact with the, with the lawmakers, because you're no closer than you are anywhere. But I think it's just to control how many people go in there. But, you know, I think once you start to license and even credential journalists, I think that you, uh, uh, I think you're heading down a, a path you don't want to go to. And also, just to add that a little bit, I, I totally get where you're coming from. This is the big difference to me. It requires a lot of specialized training to be a medical professional. It doesn't require anything at all to be a journalist. And you know, there's a big argument against where I'm coming from. But um, the thing is, journalism is just about telling people what you saw, telling people what you heard. And so I think that's the, the big delineator. Is there a standard in the verification process before a story is printed? You know, the, the standard is whether it's true or not. And uh, one of the things that is the, the biggest bulwark uh, against uh, falsehoods is things being said in public. And so, you know, one of the great things about a press conference is that you've got 20 other people in the room or 80 other people in the room who are verifying that, that that's what you saw. Now, this is where people who create fake news have an entree into people's sense of doubt, is that a lot I would say the vast majority of good reporting has to do with one-on-one -on -one relationships. And reporters cultivate relationships um, over time with people, particularly in positions of authority. And they report on things that they might be the only person that have, have heard that information. And that stuff, you are, again, like I said earlier, like a lot of our democracy is kind of based on the, on the trust system, on the, on the honor system. But at the end of the day, if it's true or not, especially when you're talking about somebody like, for example, the Secretary of the Interior, if somebody has reported something that is, that is objectively false, that normally ends up shaking out because there's, there's no background to it, you know? And the thing that people really have to worry about with fake news is it is based, as, you know, as Sam said, on fiction. And so there's a, it's, it's really difficult to express to people what the difference it makes that these reporters who have been in the room with policymakers in particular have actually had these conversations. And I know it's really abstract for most of us because you haven't been in those positions. You know, when you have not been sitting across from a governor, when you have not been um, in, in the same room with a scrum that are listening to what these uh, lawmakers or other those people are telling you, it's, it's difficult to convey that. And the day-to-day -day work of journalism is something that I don't think we do a really good job of explaining to people, and I think that's part of the reason that we are where we are right now, because we at least have to, and now we are under this intense scrutiny from people in the highest positions that are saying to the public, these people are fake, these people are lying to you. You know, this is unprecedented, and it's, it's really something that we're learning to kind of deal with on the ground. And I'm gonna tell you, the Obama administration, my boss, Colleen McCain-Nelson, she covered the Obama administration on the ground. Um, they, were not met, they were not paragons of openness. They, they really limited people's access, but it was on a different level. And the, they kind of were doing it because they thought they were the smartest kids in the room and we didn't need to all see how the sausage was made. A lot of this is going on in Kansas City, Missouri City Hall right now, too. Um, the, you know, Governor, uh, uh, Mayor Sly James, God love him, he thinks he's smarter than everybody else, and that's the reason he doesn't want to show his work on the airport, for example. Um, and I understand where that comes from, and in a lot of ways, yeah, efficiencies are made. You didn't have this silly thing called public input into the way that we're governed in this country. But, you know, that's kind of the reason that we're so annoying to Sly. You know, I like Sly a lot, but... We really advocate at the STAR for opening up the way these deals are made. Way in the back. You're standing Hi. up. Getting back to, to the Facebook phenomenon, uh, it is not a good news source. Getting back to the Facebook phenomenon, it's not a good news source. It's fun to read. And um, could you address the uh, the ability people's 
need to take responsibility for what they click on, as in clickbait, and the inadvertent perpetuation of, of stories that are false. And also, um, looking at the source line before you click. So there's a, I happen to think that there's probably, there's good clickbait and there's bad clickbait and uh, and I will click on kittens and I'm not ashamed uh, <laughs> to say that. Uh, but again, I think as we talked about before, uh, when you, it's not, it, I think it's okay, you know, you want to click over and you, uh, you click onto, uh, onto a story, you're not sure whether it's fake news or not. Uh, it's now up to you, uh, and that same internet that gives you the fake news can also help you sort through it. So I, even I find myself, you know, with some, here's some crazy website with a story that uh, I either think is, uh, is lunacy or I think is interesting or funny, but I don't know it. Uh, I know that I can search around the internet, uh, and it may take me a few, a few places to go to, but I can get to uh, probably whether or not I trust that uh, website or not. Uh, and so it does, it puts uh, a burden on you uh, that used to be you turn on the radio, you turn on the television, uh, you go out uh, and get the paper out of your driveway. You know, I may not agree with everything I see or read, but I can trust it. Uh, you don't have that luxury anymore, and so you're all going to have to work a little bit harder. And unfortunately, I think a big group of uh, people who are coming to a League of Women Voters program on a Saturday morning aren't the people who really need to hear this. <laughs> but um, again, as I said earlier, this is Facebook's problem with this. Um, Facebook exists because the internet is confusing. And I don't think people appreciate that enough. But the reason that people have glommed on to Facebook so intensely is because just going to Google and typing in, you know, Trump, Puerto Rico, is overwhelming to most people. That was actually the function that newspapers and NPR um, really sorted information for people in a much more concrete way 10 years ago. That's not how most people are getting their news anymore. The great genius of newspapers, television, radio, is that people whose job it was to cover the news and sort the news for the most important stuff first and the less important stuff last, that is has less primacy today. Facebook purported to step in and fix that you know confusion problem for folks. It has done a terrible job of it. Um, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg needs to be smacked across the face, and he needs to understand that he has, I think, probably the most power in the news business. Period. Well, until recently, I guess I would say the last election, fake news was a term I wasn't too familiar with. To me, I attribute anyone who says fake news doesn't like what was said about them. And I don't know that it is fake news then. And so I guess so if anyone says fake news, I don't trust them in what they're saying because I don't know if they're telling the truth or not. My source of news is YouTube, where you work. <coughs> I don't watch the news on TV except maybe uh, PBS. Because outside of that, I ignore them. And I think that's sad. Because I grew up with my parents depending on, they, well, they depend on the paper. We didn't have TV then. But I would like to see people depend on your kind of news more than whatever you might see on Facebook. Well, um, two things. Uh, one, I would like to see more people depending on us as well. Uh, because if not, Derek and I are going to have to go out and actually work for a living. And, and who needs that? Uh, but I will say that but, you know, but while Facebook can be our enemy, the fact is that two-thirds of the people who come to the KCUR website come through social media. And the vast majority of those people come through Facebook. So you need to... We need to manage that as an, as an organization. Uh, and I don't think we spend quite as much time uh, uh, managing it as we should. Uh, but both uh, Facebook and Twitter, maybe a third of the people who come to the KCUR.org actually come to the homepage, right? They, they come through other, most people come through other ways. 
So, uh, so while Facebook is a problem, uh, Facebook is also uh, our front door uh, to a lot of people who, uh, who come through there. Uh, and, uh, and, and just on principle, I agree with Derek, I think Mark Zuckerberg should be smacked for any number of reasons. Uh, but, uh, but when managed correctly, uh, it does bring people to not fake news, uh, and, I, and we have to embrace that as news And I also think, um, broadly speaking, that the right, whatever that means, is going to probably understand um, over the next five years, 10 years, I, maybe I'm wrong about that, that this alternate media universe that they have been building up literally since the days of Richard Nixon and Roger Ailes back in the late 60s is not good for them. I, I really think that the people, for example, the Cokes, who are not really conservatives, they're libertarians, I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, the Cokes are not, not people who want to deny marriage rights to gay people. But the Cokes want basically business to be freed from too much regulation. Okay, that, that's the, at, at the end of the day. They have been very complicit in building up this Roger Ailes, Rush Limbaugh media cabal. And folks, it is about Roger Ailes and Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh has been telling people for 25 years that you know the blacks and the gays are coming to the And they are going to understand that that is a dead end, I think, at some point, because the demographics of this country are extremely clear. I don't know if any of you guys follow Rick Wilson on Twitter. He's a GOP media strategist. He has been sounding this alarm for his fellow Republicans for a long time. It is good for democracy for, for conservatives to understand that lying to people is bad. Um, I, don't, I don't know... I do know, actually, because I talk to these people all the time. They are well aware of what is going on in the White House right now. And the people who really own, who hold the purse strings are the ones who need to turn the switch on this crap. Because if, if you know, Limbaugh doesn't have very many advertisers anymore. I don't, I don't quite understand the model of how he's holding on the way he is. Um, but the advertising is what keeps this garbage afloat. And Corporate citizens of this world are the ones who ultimately pay our paychecks. And, you know, nobody who does business in the world wants to basically eliminate their customer base, their worker base, etc. They're going to understand that telling the truth is good for democracy and for business at the end of the day. So how that's all going to shake out, I don't know. But we're in a really, really weird place right now with the way... Facebook had a huge impact over the last election. Yeah, I wanted to um, address the Facebook issue. I, I do use Facebook and I do uh, post articles from other sources onto Facebook. Rarely click anything that could be an advertisement on Facebook, but I think one of the issues is that Facebook is so easily accessible. And when I go, um, and we have a um, subscription to the New York Times print copy and digital. But I would love to have access to a lot more resources. But every time I go online, they ask for another class for subscription, which I understand, you know, you have to be supporting that. But there are many sources that I think would be reliable sources that I cannot subscribe to every single one. And so I have found reliable sources, but it takes work to go out and find them if and that, that they're free. Now, I work with, I teach 20-something. They're never going to go out and get a print source. They are doing everything on the internet, and they are worried about trees. I mean, literally worried about trees. So they go out on the internet, and if we ask them, where, what sources are you using? I mean, it could be anything. I mean, they don't know which sources are... Um, evidence-based. And your and, question is? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But what can you do? I mean, if, if Facebook is the place that people go because it's easy access, what can the, you know, the true factual media do to make that easier for people who are going to go to Facebook no matter what to get that real information? I mean, it, it's blocked. It really is blocking 
you know, real sources are blocking people from getting that access. You know, there's not a media organization that's not on Facebook, uh, and it just depends on what you want to click on. So, uh, for me, uh, Facebook for me is a uh, personally is a closed thing. Uh, it's a way to keep up with uh, with uh, folks who I know. But these are but the people who I know are the ones who are reposting uh, stories uh, that I trust. Uh, but you know, we're we post our stories on Facebook. Kansas City Star does, the Times does. So there's a lot of because they realize that that's their front door as well to, to social media. So you can limit what you click on on Facebook to just those sources if you want. And here's kind of a uh, little little secret. I don't know if. The, Everybody still does it, but um, there are. If you come to some legacy media sites through Facebook, you don't necessarily have to have a subscription. They'll let that uh, click come through to the uh, to the story. So even if you don't subscribe to the Washington Post, and I don't know if they do this or not, but if you come to them through Facebook or Twitter, uh, even without a subscription, you can you can get through that. But I think it's just knowing uh, who it, it's. There, every legacy media is on Facebook and Twitter, uh, and that's generally where I uh, where I limit my news uh, my news viewing to uh, are those places uh, are, are those legacy media sites. Yeah, like for example, Wall Street Journal. If you if you Google search a Wall Street Journal story and you click on it, you you have to have a subscription. If you find that same story they posted on Facebook, you click on their Facebook link. And that's that's where the advertising level is in 2017, um, October 2017. I bet it's going to be in a really different place in October 2019, myself, or 2021. I have a question, and um, actually, anyone that knows me knows that I now have actually it's a two-part question because someone whispered to me and said, "Ask this question." Um, I'll ask my question first, um, and that question is: is that in the League of Women Voters we have a committee? that is studying fake news or media literacy. And what we are attempting to do as one part of our charge is to come up with maybe some guidelines that individuals should use to be able to discern what is true or what is fact and what is fiction. Would each of you uh, quickly uh, list you know, five or six or whatever the criteria would be because one of the things we know that, number one, that there should be um, oh, uh, someone that definitely has signed and then we can look and see who that person is. But we also know that it's some cross kind of investigation. But what would you say that the common person should do in order to discern facts from fiction? I think that number one for me would be uh, verification. If somebody is making a claim that particularly seems uh, surprising and that you're not seeing repeated elsewhere and you you know then look the person up who's making the claim, I would have a high degree of suspicion. So uh, blockbusters obviously usually come from a single journalist or in, in some cases a team. But they are relying entirely on their reputations. It, a Watergate um, uh, revelation could not possibly come from a blogger who's never posted something before. Right? That, does that mean that it's not true? Not necessarily. It's possible that somebody who has never published anything journalistically before could actually come up with a scoop. Their credibility, though, is everything. And you know, one of the things I would say in our business, Dan Rather is the, the prime example for somebody who wasted a journalistic career, in my opinion. I, I think he's a huge journalistic tragedy because he ran with a story that he did not verify. And folks, what Dan Rather did really was an immense blot, and it's a real blot on his history because he ran with a fake story. It, you know, probably the underpinnings to what went on with that story, with, uh, with you know, the memo um, about George Bush's military service, probably had some validity to him. But he published a new story about an obviously fake memo. He did not run the ground. So I guess what I'm basically saying is that verification. Is, verification is. See, I'm trying to get a list because everyone's looking at me like, get your list and where we can get our question. 
Let me just give you my, the first thing that I look for, uh, if it's in a website that I haven't seen before, uh, but I, you know, the, the headline doesn't have the word alien in it, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to click there and see that, oh, uh, maybe there's something there. Uh, when I scan that story and I see no attribution, right, there's, no, there's nobody, nothing that says some, somebody said this, or I don't see quotation marks, uh, that is the first red flag to me that, uh, that this is just made up out of, uh, out of whole cloth. Attribution, even if it's just sources, right? Uh, and, and you have to make the choice whether you believe the sources that the New York Times have are credible. Uh, but what you'll see in a lot of fake news stories is everything just presented uh, as if it is uh, as if it is common knowledge. So if, if you see no attribution, if you don't see that anybody's been quoted, uh, you need to be suspicious. Would, 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 would you each try to give us the worst example of fake news each of you has ever heard? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, it was funny. So last night, I just Googled fake news. And I have to say, it, it's, it's a flood of stories that, uh, with the, just the most bizarre headlines and premises. Uh, so, but, but I'll answer it this way. And I think, it's, uh, I think it was the, the Pizzagate scandal from the election. And what made that so bad uh, was that Anybody that would believe that there was a, a, a pedophile ring being run out of a pizzeria by the Clintons, I don't know what color the sky is in their world, uh, but it's troubling. But the most troubling thing was that somebody believed it so much uh, that they got in their car, they drove from North Carolina, and they shot the place up with a rifle. Uh, and so that, for me, is the, is the worst. Uh, not just because it was so bizarre that the charge was so... Uh, it was so disgusting, uh, but that it moved somebody to uh, it moved somebody to action. And can I build on that too? That Pizzagate really, I think, is sort of the quintessential example of that in this past election. But on top of that, Mike Cernovich, who is he, mostly a Twitter guy, who was I would say arguably probably the most important person in spreading that um, story, I would guess, he has a source in the White House who's right about something. Um, Mike Cernovich has been tweeting some news that actually is true. He, he's got somebody deep inside the White House who is really high up, who is feeding him stuff. And so these are the things we need to worry about. There have always been bad actors in every White House, R&D, always, people who are working it for themselves. But there are people who are so cynical in this White House as to use somebody like Mike Cernovich to do their dirty work for them. It's very troubling. And I'm also going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to name some names here, but um, anybody aware of Tony's Kansas City here in Kansas City? It, it is a little bit of Kansas City's own version of InfoWars. Uh, Tony Patello, who runs Tony's Kansas City, has some sources in City Hall. He's right about something. But the, those things that he's right about are also interspersed with um, gratuitous pictures of women in bikinis and racism and, you know, just extremely scurrilous. Um, accusations uh, against people. And the problem is there is no journalistic underpinning to what these folks are doing. The, the internet has enabled everybody to have a megaphone that is turned to 10. And the problem for those of us who are, who are in you know, the traditional news business is that we have developed this code of conduct over the past 60, 70 years, as, as Mr. Zeff said earlier on, that has sort of self-regulated us, that we are doing this on a basis of respectability, verif uh, verification, and wanting to do it right. You're only as strong as the uh, veracity of the last story that you published. To folks who are willing to put out any number of false things, they don't care if you know five tweets were garbage and one is gold, because their brand is garbage, and they know that they're appealing to people who just want to basically believe that they have secret information that nobody has. This will all come back to you. The, the fake news appeal is the appeal of you being in the know when everybody else is wrong. Let me just say one, other, one just one quick thing about that. So. Uh, and I read Tony, uh, Tony's Kansas City, and uh, and the thing that, it, and, and Derek's right, that there are times that he 
has uh, he has a fact and it's correct. Uh, but here's the here's the difference. Just because the information is correct, that doesn't make the story right. And that's what journalists do, right? You take these facts and you figure out what the right story is. Uh, and that's the difference between gathering the fact, whether you get that from a human source or you get it from a database, uh, but then putting that through the uh, journalistic art filter and figuring out uh, what the right story is. Uh, and Tony's yet to do that. And also, can I point out that this is really the thing that Sam was saying? Opinion journalism basically is based on this system of seizing on facts that are correct and then making your case. And what makes you credible or not is whether you're extrapolating things um, to the logical extension. And one of the things I've always said about, particularly the fire, uh, the, the firebomb throwers, you know, the Rush Limbaugh's on the right, the Keith Holdman's on the left, most of the time their discrete facts are correct. That's part of the reason they've been able to create these long careers. But the, the case they build around that usually tries to play to their base and to go to the extremes, and that's, I think, where the real problem is. Sam, I wanted to know, um, did you speak to us about early news and early bird, I'm sorry. And then I also, uh, I think I got two uh, things that we can do back on my question, and one was uh, that we need to have verification and attribution were the two things that I think I got uh, for our community <coughs> looking at coming up with a list of ways to discern fact from fiction. But now to speak to Early Bird. So Early Bird is the uh, newsletter that uh, Kyle Palmer, who is our morning newscaster, puts out uh, every morning. If you haven't subscribed to it, it's, uh, it's four or five things that you probably need to know to get your, uh, to get your day going. I just want to say that he starts at four o'clock in the morning, so uh, please yeah. appreciate the effort that, uh, uh, that he puts into it. Uh, the thing that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, important uh, about that is it used to be, uh, when Derek and I first started, uh, that we would put out our product and you would come to us. And we would be happy with that and we would be thankful, but you know, we would open our door, uh, we'd turn the radio station on and, and, and you folks would come. Uh, now, uh, what the early bird and what Skim and what uh, NPR does with their, and the New York Times does with their uh, morning podcast, is that we have to come to you. Uh, it puts, uh, it makes it harder on us, but uh, but I like the uh, I like the extra work, right? So now we have to come to you uh, and open up the door and say, please come in and, uh, and, and consume what we've uh, what we've done uh, what we've done to you. It certainly makes it harder, but uh, I actually like it. Uh, I like it quite a bit more. Before I wrap this up, I uh, want to share with you since we are people of action. One possible thing that you can do to combat fake news. And this suggestion comes from the Southern Poverty Law Center in their article, 100 Days in Trump's America. And they say, to stop alternative facts from being spread, every day post at least one important news story from a respected news outlet on Facebook. Make certain that you include what you believe are the most important two or three sentences from the story, because realistically, people are not going to click on the link and read everything. They're going to read the headline and your one or two sentences. A few may read the real article. So if Facebook is driving our news, and it's the number of times things are posted, please post a reliable article every day. Now, I want to thank our speakers and welcome back up. Um, did, did I, did, I just had a comment I wanted to make. There was a lady in the back that talked about um, the cost of, of subscribing to the New York Times or whatever. Uh, I would remind you that your public library has all of those. Yay! And you have already paid for that because of your tax money, so go on the the JOCO website and uh, get your news out. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention one thing really quick that um, uh, I think Melissa Carlson posted on uh, Facebook a couple months ago. Um, it was a uh, uh, just a chart. It, it, yes, yeah. it was a chart 
they kind of showed the, the major newspaper and uh, outlets, I think is what it was, and kind of which ones tended to, to lean a little more left or a little more right, and which ones kind of reported their news more center. And so I've used that um, as a resource just to kind of know what I'm reading a little bit. And you know, I'm okay with reading, reading stuff a little you know, left or a little right. I just, I just want to know in my frame of reference. So um, that is on our Facebook page, and I'm thinking it was, what, four months ago that you reposted that? We could, we could put that on the website. Okay. I post more than one good story every day. <laughs> <laughs> Will you please give a round of applause for our students?